Usually, I see the back of your heads because I'm sitting right there. But I must say, you look much better from this angle. A wonderful group, my church family. We pray together for each other. We love each other. Your joy is my joy, and your pain is my pain. If you will share with me, I think. I was a pastor as a second career for about 13 years. I had nine churches because sometimes there are two-point charges. And I think one of the greatest joys, the two greatest joys of, as a preacher, I love Sunday mornings because I love to share His Word, to break the Word of God and share it with His people. The next thing I love the most is to visit them. Just ordinary times in their homes, just to get to know them. I have mostly country churches, and we are not formal. We can walk into each other's homes all the time. They feel free to come into the parsonage anytime because they feel it's their parsonage. And we share meals. If it's meal time, I'll sit down and eat with them. Whatever they're having is great for me, and they know that I'm not picky. They just treat me as one of their families, and it's a really wonderful feeling. And I miss that. So sometimes when Phil goes visiting, I go along with him, and I get to see some of you folks. I thank God for bringing me here to Columbus, Ohio, because I have a son who lives here, and another one in D.C. And after my husband passed away, November of 2015, to be with the Lord, I decided, even though I live in a beautiful place called Sedona, Arizona, it's practically like God's backyard. But what fun is it to live in a beautiful big house all by yourself? I would rather be close to my children, so I decided to move out here. And would you know it? My daughter-in-law and my son started to look for a place for me to stay to rent, and they picked this place right down about two minutes walk. And they said, main reason is there's a Methodist church right there, <laughs> and they did right. I couldn't have come to a better church. You really have a wonderful, two wonderful pastors. And uh, you know, I'm very honored because you know Nathan guards his pulpit very jealously. <laughs> he doesn't just invite anybody to preach for him. I was so shocked when he asked me. And it is because Phil kept on recommending me. <laughs> and he believed in Phil. <laughs> But I got to know Nathan quite well too. And you are very, very blessed to have these two wonderful ministers in your midst, who really care for you. So there's no reason why this church shouldn't grow. Now there's a preacher who always stops on time, but one time he went on and on and on and past 12 o'clock. People wonder why. Well, this is what happens. Usually he pops a hard candy in his mouth, and when that is all melted, he knows he has to wind up. That Sunday, by mistake, he popped a button in his mouth, <laughs> and it just wouldn't melt, and he just wouldn't stop. I assure you, this morning, I neither have button nor candy in my mouth. <laughs> Now you see three phenomena from the sky. What is she going to talk about? The three, I'll tell you right now, so you won't be suspenseful. The three phenomena I'm going to touch on. The first one is eclipse. The second one is shooting star or comet. The third one is the full moon. And did you notice last night it was a beautiful full moon, wasn't it? And I looked at it and I said, "Aha! Exactly what I'm going to talk about tomorrow." That is today. I will not embarrass you. I will not ask you to have a show of hands. Okay? We're going to talk about three different kinds of Christian. And you will know better than anybody else which kind you belong to, right? And you might quickly like to shift to another category, but I won't ask for a show of hands. Now, first of all, I'm going to talk about the eclipse Christian. You all know about the phenomenon of eclipse. When I was a youngster in maybe fourth grade, one time, oh, everybody was so excited. We issued special Sunglasses to view the eclipse was supposed to be a very, very important and rare eclipse. Won't happen for another that hundred years or whatever. 
So I learned very young, maybe eight or nine, what an eclipse is about. Now, would it be stupid for people to say that the sun is dead? The sun is gone? Of course not. When we fall into total darkness, it's because some heavenly body came between the sun and the earth and cast a shadow, right? We know very well the sun is still there and healthy and well. If the sun is dead, we're in real trouble. In the early 1960s, when I came from Hong Kong to study uh, at Bob Jones University to go to college, it was right around the time that people like to say God is dead. And we know very well God is not dead. He will never die. He's forever and ever. Why do people say God is dead? It is just sad that people who call themselves Christians and children of God, they don't exhibit any sign of God's life. They are dead Christians. And they cause people to think that the God they claim to be their God is dead. But God himself is alive and well and still operating in each one of our lives if we would just allow him. If I stand here and tell you all the miracles that he did in my family's life and in my life, you'll be here till midnight tonight. And I think you'll be very hungry and I will do that to you. But needless to say, God is a living God. Continues to work every single day in our lives, whether we realize it or not. And when we definitely ask him and call him to work in our lives, he is right there. He never lets us down. Every day there is a miracle, an answer to prayer. If we would only believe and look to him. Now, when we talk about the eclipse, would we ever say that the sun is dead? No. When I first came in the 19, early 1960s to the States, as I say, it's a popular saying, they say, God is dead. And I said, wow, America must be a very sad country that has a dead God. Because we in China, we know God is living and well because he answers prayers all the time. And so, unfortunately, many Christians are like eclipse Christians. Because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's Romans 123. It's not God, it's us who will call by his name, who's supposed to be his representative, like Jesus Christ is the express image of God. When Jesus was in the world, people look at him and they know that what God is like, that he's a God of love and a God who works miracles. But may I ask you, if people look at you, what kind of God are they going to see? A loving, forgiving, kind, and gentle God? Or one who's bad-tempered? One who doesn't have love? One is full of strife and jealousy? What kind of God do you show to all those around you? Are you an eclipse Christian? That would be so sad. But you know, you don't have to do bad things. You don't have to be somebody who's in Mexican security in prison, having either killed or robbed or whatever, to be eclipse Christian. You could be doing all kinds of good deeds, and you can still be eclipse Christian. Because you know why? So often, when we do something that's really noble and good, what do we do? We pat ourselves on the back and say, well, I did pretty good, didn't I? Look at me. We never give the glory to God. Even in the simple act of just bowing and saying grace before we receive a food, to acknowledge the fact that it doesn't come from us, but from God, that is something to give God the glory. You know, uh, in the early 80s and late 80s, we sponsored many students from China to come to this country to study for the college degrees or graduate degrees, including some of my husband's nieces and nephews. And so a niece came, and she's from a communist country, never heard of God, no God. And she saw us eating and saying grace. And she immediately asked, what are you guys doing? We said, we're thanking God for our food. 
She says, why? I know that you guys work hard, you make money, you go out to buy grocery and you cook and we eat. Why do you have to thank God? Just thank yourselves. And I said to her, if the God doesn't send sun and rain, where will we get our food? If the Lord doesn't give us health to work, how can we be making a living? Everything is from God, and I tried to witness to her. Eventually, she became a Christian, but it took a while because she was indoctrinated from growing up all the way that there is no God. And everything we do is to our own credit. Now, you don't have to do bad things to eclipse God's glory. You can be doing good things, but not ever giving the credit to God so people will never know. I will share an experience with you. The year was 1984. I've been invited to go to Beijing, which is then the biggest city in China, the capital, to give a big concert to play with the Broadcasting Symphony Orchestra, Beethoven's Fourth Concerto, with the orchestra accompanying the piano solo. Furthermore, because it was a broadcasting symphony, it's being taped and broadcasted over all of China. And if you have a television, there's only one program, one channel. That's what you will see, right? So there I was sitting at the piano, and the Beethoven Fourth Concerto starts out with the piano part instead of the orchestra. So the conductor was waiting for me to get ready and begin. He turned around and looked at me, and somebody else told me later, I was bowing down to pray. There's no other way I can acknowledge the fact that I'm depending on God to help me except to pray. Now, this is a sight that's hardly ever seen in China, which is right finished with the Cultural Revolution, and it's atheistic and strongly against all religion of the West and so on. So in the audience was a young taxi cab driver who's driven me a lot here and there, and I gave him a ticket so he could come in here. He said he was never so frightened when I was praying. And I said, why are you so frightened? They won't throw me in jail. They can't do that. I'm an American citizen just because of praying. He says, no, but do you know the television camera capture you praying? So all of China will see that you're asking God to help you before you play the piano. And he says, if you play well today, fine. But what if you don't play well? <laughs> Where is God going to put his face? And I said, oh, thank God I never thought about that. <laughs> if I did, I may be too scared to pray. But you see, the TV camera caught it, caught me closing my eyes and bowing my head and praying. So it's so important. If there's any way you can let other people know that you are a Christian, you should do so. Sometimes not by words. Even high school students, when you are in school eating lunch with everybody else, do you bow your head for a few seconds to give thanks to God? It may make you look like you're out of it because nobody else does it. But that's your silent witness that you thank God for the food. You're different from other people. It could be just a simple matter of returning thanks to him and acknowledging him and not be an eclipse Christian and hide his glory. So many people, when they did something good, they say, I did it. They give the glory to himself. Wouldn't it be wonderful if each one of us seated here is not an eclipsed Christian, but glorify God for everything he's done for us and everyday life. You know, even we are here this morning, it's thanks to him. We drove here, anytime, anywhere, there could be a car accident, right? We're being protected. We're here safe and sound. We can sit here and worship him. All this is God's glory. We are not to eclipse his glory. We're not to steal his glory and say, I did it. I'm pretty smart. No. Give him all the glory. Because every sinner in the world has fallen short of the glory of God. It's high time that his own children, that he called his own, that he bought with his precious blood, will acknowledge his grace and his love in your life. It is not what we do, but it's the Christ in us that gives us the power, the wisdom, the strength 
to live each day of our lives. If I tell you some of the stories, how Lord brought us through, my mother with four children, she was not trained to do any kind of work outside of the home, and our father left us, and there's not one bit of money. Many times she pulled out all her purses and nothing fell out, not even a penny. And somehow, she brought all of us up. All of us went to college. It is the glory of God. Many a time, I remember this incident very well, there's no more food. And we have a faithful servant who has been with us for many, many years. And even though we have no money to pay her, she is still with us. So, one day she says, Mistress, I need to go to the market. Can you give me some market money? My mother poured out her purse, and not a penny came out. So she says, all right, we'll all kneel down in front of the bed when we ask our God. Do you know when we opened our front door, and our house was a pretty decent house with a garden and everything. Nobody knows people living in this house has nothing to eat. We opened the front door, and there was a big bag of rice, a can of oil, and a bag of peanuts. Until this day, we never knew who sent it. But the Lord knows what we need. And this sort of thing happens so often that it was no longer like a miracle to us. We just expect the Lord to take care of us. And you know, we find it so extraordinary in America when we hear about God providing our physical needs. But how about our emotional, our spiritual, our intellectual needs that the Lord is meeting all the time if you would just look to Him? There's no way that I could go through college with no money from home, somehow came to the United States, went through three and a half years of college for, for the four years, and then continued to do my master's and my doctorate. It was all the Lord. And then helped my brothers and sisters to come over one by one. It is the Lord. He can do amazingly, abundantly more than you ever dreamed or even asked for if we only realize that our God is not dead. Now I talk about the second kind of Christian. And we read in the Bible the story of the sower who soweth the word. And these are they, are those are they that fell on the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word. And these are they, in like manner, that are sown on stony ground. And when they have heard the word, and immediate receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves. So they do not endure, only but for a time. And afterwards, when affliction or persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And in the Old Testament, Jeremiah, God says the people of Israel are so deaf, go shout in their ears. Say this. Go and cry, that means loudly, in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying that thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, which wentest after me in the wilderness, in the land that was not sown. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken the fountain of living water and hewed for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Instead of turning to the Lord for what we need and our satisfaction, we go and make dig cisterns, the broken cisterns that will not hold water. We're only temporarily satisfied, but not for long. Why do we turn away from the Lord? And it says that he remembers our first love for him. And he doesn't want to let that go, love go. Ephesus was a wonderful church. And it received many praises in the book of Revelations. But the Lord says, I have one thing against you only. You have forsaken your first love for me. So we think of the phenomena in the sky that's like a comet. One moment it's in the firmament, bright and shining, and we look at it with wonder. The next time, all of a sudden, whoop, it's gone. Many Christians are like that. 
when they first accepted Christ, they're full of love for the Lord. They're on fire. You see them in church all the time. But in a short time, when troubles come, it's like the light is squeezed out of them. They left. They gave up. They went to their, back to their old ways. And many times, we may not do it outwardly. We may still be here in church physically. But inside, we might have already turned away from our Lord. Let us not be a comet, a shooting star Christian. That's only good for a little time. And then we are gone. And nobody will see you anymore. Now, the last kind of Christian I call the full moon Christian. Jesus Christ is more beautiful than the full moon. And we have to gaze on him and look at him. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Do you know that whatever you look like, that's what you're going to become? Do you recognize the fact that husband and wives who have been married many, many years, what happened? They look like each other. They have the same mannerisms. They act like each other and talk like each other. When the husband opens his mouth to say any something, the wife can finish the sentence for him. They think alike because they have walked for 40 or 50 years together. They have become one in every sense of the word. And if we walk with Jesus and look to him, that's what you will be like. Looking unto Jesus, says Hebrew, the author and finisher of our faith. We don't have any faith that doesn't come from the Lord. He's the one who starts it, the author. And he's the one who will complete it. And in between, if we keep on looking and looking at his glorious face, nothing will go wrong. You know, the sun, the moon itself has no light. It reflects the light from the sun. You realize that? We have no light ourselves. If we keep on looking at Jesus, we will reflect his light. When people see us, it's not me, Lily, anymore but they see the Christ in me. So if we all look to Jesus, walk with him and talk with him, then we'll become like him. As a youngster in Hong Kong, we don't have money to do any kind of recreation or entertainment. We don't even have a television. So when at nighttime comes and it gets cool, we do have a beautiful yard with a long driveway. So all of us carry little stools and sit in the yard sat in the yard and just enjoy each other. Grandmother, mother, all the children. We talked to each other and reviewed the happenings of the day. It was a wonderful time of fellowship and closeness. And we will gaze up if there's a beautiful full moon. We'll look at the stars in the canopy of the sky. It's free. We don't have to pay any money. But we enjoy each other. And we enjoy the beautiful sky above us and know that God is still taking care of us. Our Heavenly Father never forsakes us, even sometimes if our earthly father forgets us. And so we look at the moon and appreciate it. And on the night like last night, I know if it were in those days, all of us would be looking at the moon. And the more you look like the moon, the more your face will shine. Have you seen couples that live for a long time? They even look like each other, right? And one can read the other's thoughts. And if you ask one a question, the other one can answer for you. That's the way if we walk with Jesus year after year, the closer we are near him, if we are a moon-gazing Christian and we know our Lord is fairer than the fairest moon, we will be more and more like our Savior. So that when people look at us, they will see there's something different about us that they will long for that too. They will say, what does this person have? that I don't have. Why is it that when something bad happens, that person is not shaken? He seems to be rock solid. What is the thing that's propping him up? They started to get curious, and they started to get envious, and they want what you have. It's a day-by-day -day thing. It doesn't happen overnight. But the longer you live with Jesus Christ, the more you love him, and talk to him, have fellowship. Gradually, his nature will become yours. And when people look at you, they will see the full moon. Jesus Christ is more beautiful than the full moon. 
So now I propose to you the three different phenomena from the sky. We have the comet, the shooting star, we have the eclipse, and then we have the full moon. And I just ask you quietly to look in your heart. Lord Jesus, what kind of Christian am I? Am I an eclipse Christian, hiding your glory? Even when I do things that's wonderful, I do not give you the credit so people never knew that it was with your help that was done. I claim it for myself, and I pat myself on the back. Or am I a shooting star Christian who have long forsaken my first love for you? Ephesus was a wonderful church. It was highly praised in Book of Revelation as one of the seven churches that really did well. But the Lord says, however, I have something against you. You have lost your first love for me. Just like the Israelites, when they left the wilderness and are secure and become a nation, they forgot their God. And God sent Jeremiah and go cry in their ears, in their hearings, come back to me. Why do you heal for yourself broken cisterns that will not hold water when I am the living water and ready to supply all your needs? I'm here right for you. Why are you turning to other gods? Why are you turning to your own smarts to carry yourself through when I'm willing to bear your burden day by day and give you the wisdom and light to live every day of your life so that you can glorify me let us not forget that without him, we are nothing. We have no light of our own. We are only reflecting his life. So will you try this week to be a moon-gazing Christian, to only look to Jesus and see how beautiful he is, how he can satisfy every need in your life from the beginning to the end, I just say one last story. I don't know about the end yet, but I know the beginning. As a little baby, my mother took me as refugee running away from the Japanese in the train going out west, where it's still relatively safe. And in the train, I developed pneumonia. I was burning up, and there was no help, and I would have died. But you see, God says, I have still use for this little child. She's not going to die. In the train, in the same car, was one doctor. In his black bag was one shot of penicillin. You know, 70-some years ago, penicillin is a new drug and a miracle drug and very hard to come by. So he gave me that one shot. And I lived, so I'm here today. You see, it's God. God knows exactly. And he put that doctor with the one shot of penicillin right in the same car. All our lives, it's not happy coincidence. It's God. It's God. So let us pray. God, we give you thanks. You made us, you saved us, and you loved us. It is your will and desire that we follow you closely and serve you with our own hearts. It is your desire that we become more and more like Jesus, looking unto him who is the author and finisher of our faith. Within us, there is no goodness, but when we are in you, we can truly do great things to glorify you. We pray that, Lord, if we are an Eclipse Christian, even today, we will stop being that and we'll start glorifying you. And if we are a shooting star, Christian, help us to turn around and remember what it was like to have our first love for you. And Lord, keep us to be a moon-gazing Christian. Keep on looking at the face of Jesus so we will shine with his light and reflect his love and glory. Lord, that's the purpose you have for each one of us, that we are little representation of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are his ambassadors to this world. So help each one of us this week to try our best to be moon-gazing Christians. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank what you so much. What a blessing. What a blessing.